A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain, Chapter Three, Knights of the Table Round. Mainly the round table talk was monologues, narrative accounts of the adventures in which these prisoners were captured and their friends and backers killed and stripped of their steeds and armor. As a general thing, as far as I could make out, these murderous adventures were not forays undertaken to avenge injuries, nor to settle old disputes or sudden fallings out. No, as a rule they were simply duels between strangers, duels between people who had never even been introduced to each other, and between whom existed no cause of offense whatever. Many a time I had seen a couple of boys, strangers, meet by chance and say simultaneously, I can lick you, and go at it on the spot. But I had always imagined until now that that sort of thing belonged to children only, and was a sign and mark of childhood. But here were these big boobies sticking to it and taking pride in it clear up into full age and beyond. Yet there was something very engaging about these great simple-hearted creatures, something attractive and lovable. There did not seem to be brains enough in the entire nursery, so to speak, to bait a fish-hook with, but you didn't seem to mind that after a little, because you soon saw that brains were not needed in a society like that, and indeed would have marred it, hindered it, spoiled its symmetry, perhaps rendered its existence impossible. There was a fine manliness observable in almost every face, and in some a certain loftiness and sweetness that rebuked your belittling criticisms and stilled them. A most noble benignity and purity reposed in the countenance of him they called Sir Galahad, and likewise in the king's also, and there was majesty and greatness in the giant frame and high bearing of Sir Lancelot of the Lake. There was presently an incident which centred the general interest upon this Sir Lancelot. At a sign from a sort of master of ceremonies, six or eight of the prisoners rose and came forward in a body and knelt on the floor and lifted up their hands toward the ladies' gallery and begged the grace of a word with the Queen. The most conspicuously situated lady in that massed flower-bed of feminine show and finery inclined her head by way of assent and then the spokesman of the prisoners delivered himself and his fellows into her hands for free pardon, ransom, captivity, or death, as she in her good pleasure might elect. And this, as he said, he was doing by command of Sir Kay, the seneschal, whose prisoners they were, he having vanquished them by his single might and prowess in sturdy conflict in the field. Surprise and astonishment flashed from face to face all over the house. The Queen's gratified smile faded out at the name of Sir Kay, and she looked disappointed, and the page whispered in my ear with an accent and manner expressive of extravagant derision, "'Sir Kay, forsooth! Oh, call me pet names, dearest, call me a marine! In twice a thousand years shall the unholy invention of man labor at odds to beget the fellow to this majestic lie. Every eye was fastened with severe inquiry upon Sir Kay, but he was equal to the occasion. He got up and played his hand like a major, and took every trick. He said he would state the case exactly according to the facts. He would tell the simple, straightforward tale, without comment of his own. And then, said he, if ye find glory and honor due, ye will give it unto him who is the mightiest man of his hands that ever bare shield or strake with sword in the ranks of Christian battle, even him that sitteth there. And he pointed to Sir Launcelot. Ah, he fetched them. It was a rattling good stroke. Then he went on and told how Sir Launcelot, seeking adventures some brief time gone by, killed seven giants at one sweep of his sword, and set a hundred and forty-two captive maidens free, and then went further, still seeking adventures, and found him, Sir Kay, fighting a desperate fight against nine foreign knights, and straightway took the battle solely into his own hands, and conquered the nine. And that night Sir Launcelot rose quietly, and dressed him in Sir Kay's armor, and took Sir Kay's horse, and gat him away into distant lands, and vanquished sixteen knights in one pitched battle, and thirty-four in another, 
and all these and the former nine he made to swear that about whitsuntide they would ride to arthur's court and yield them to queen guinevere's hands as captives of sir kay the seneschal spoil of his knightly prowess and now here were these half-dozen and the rest would be along as soon as they might be healed of their desperate wounds well it was touching to see the queen blush and smile and look embarrassed and happy and fling furtive glances at sir lancelot that would have got him shot in arkansas to a dead certainty everybody praised the valor and magnanimity of sir lancelot and as for me i was perfectly amazed that one man all by himself should have been able to beat down and capture such battalions of practised fighters i said as much to clarence but this mocking featherhead only said and sir kay had had time to get another skin of sour wine into him ye had seen the account doubled i looked at the boy in sorrow and as i looked i saw the cloud of a deep despondency settle upon his countenance i followed the direction of his eye and saw that a very old and white-bearded man clothed in a flowing black gown had risen and was standing at the table upon unsteady legs and feebly swaying his ancient head and surveying the company with his watery and wandering eye the same suffering look that was in the page's face was observable in all the faces around the look of dumb creatures who know that they must endure and make no moan mary we shall have it again sighed the boy that same old weary tale that he hath told a thousand times in the same words and that he will tell till he dieth every time he hath gotten his barrel full and feeleth his exaggeration mill a-working would god i had died or i saw this day who is it merlin the mighty liar and magician perdition singe him for the weariness he worketh with this one tale but that men fear him for that he hath the storms and the lightnings and all the devils that be in hell at his beck and call they would have dug his entrails out this many years ago to get at that tale and squelch it he telleth it always in the third person making believe he is too modest to glorify himself maledictions light upon him misfortune be his dole good friend prithee call me for evensong the boy nestled himself upon my shoulder and pretended to go to sleep the old man began his tale and presently the lad was asleep in reality so also were the dogs and the court the lackeys and the files of men-at-arms the droning voice droned on a soft snoring arose on all sides and supported it like a deep and subdued accompaniment of wind instruments some heads were bowed upon folded arms some lay back with open mouths that issued unconscious music the flies buzzed and bit unmolested the rats swarmed softly out from a hundred holes and pattered about and made themselves at home everywhere and one of them sat up like a squirrel on the king's head and held a bit of cheese in its hands and nibbled it and dribbled the crumbs in the king's face with naive and impudent irreverence it was a tranquil scene and restful to the weary eye and the jaded spirit this was the old man's tale he said right so the king and merlin departed and went until an hermit that was a good man and a great leech so the hermit searched all his wounds and gave him good salves so the king was there three days and then were his wounds well amended that he might ride and go and so departed and as they rode arthur said i have no sword no force footnote from m t no matter said merlin hereby is a sword that shall be yours an i may so they rode till they came to a lake the which was a fair water and broad and in the midst of the lake arthur was ware of an arm clothed in white samite that held a fair sword in that hand lo said merlin yonder is that sword that i spake of with that they saw a damsel going upon the lake what damsel is that said arthur that is the lady of the lake said merlin and within that lake is a rock and therein is as fair a place as any on earth and richly be seen and this damsel will come to you anon and then speak ye fair to her that she will give you that sword anon withal came the damsel unto arthur and saluted him and he her again damsel said arthur 
what sword is that that yonder the arm holdeth above the water i would it were mine for i have no sword sir arthur king said the damsel that sword is mine and if ye will give me a gift when i ask it you ye shall have it by my faith said arthur i will give you what gift ye will ask well said the damsel go ye into yonder barge and row yourself to the sword and take it and the scabbard with you and i will ask my gift when i see my time so sir arthur and merlin alight and tied their horses to two trees and so they went into the ship and when they came to the sword that the hand held sir arthur took it up by the handles and took it with him and the arm and the hand went under the water and so they came unto the land and rode forth and then sir arthur saw a rich pavilion what signifieth yonder pavilion it is the knight's pavilion said merlin that ye fought with last sir pellinore but he is out he is not there he hath ado with a knight of yours that hight egleme and they have fought together and at the last egleme fled and else he had been dead and he hath chased him even to corleon and we shall meet with him anon in the highway that is well said said arthur now have i a sword now will i wage battle with him and be avenged on him sir ye shall not so said merlin for the knight is weary of fighting and chasing so that ye shall have no worship to have ado with him also he will not lightly be matched of one knight living and therefore it is my counsel let him pass for he shall do you good service in short time and his sons after his days also ye shall see that day in short space ye shall be right glad to give him your sister to wed when i see him i will do as ye advise said arthur then arthur looked on the sword and liked it passing well whether liketh you better said merlin the sword or the scabbard me liketh better the sword said arthur ye are more unwise said merlin for the scabbard is worth ten of the sword for while ye have the scabbard upon you ye shall never lose no blood be ye never so sore wounded therefore keep well the scabbard always with you so they rode into carleon and by the way they met with sir pellinore but merlin had done such a craft that pellinore saw not arthur and he passed by without any words i marvel said arthur that the knight would not speak sir said merlin he saw you not for an he had seen you ye had not lightly departed so they came unto carleon whereof his knights were passing glad and when they heard of his adventures they marvelled that he would jeopard his person so alone but all men of worship said it was merry to be under such a chieftain that would put his person in adventure as other poor knights did End of chapter three